This is the fourth in the series of videos on 951 Cap A. Make sure you watch the other videos first. Links are in the description below. All of this 951 Cap A stuff happens for a particular U.S. shareholder for all of the CFCs she owns whose tax years end with or within her tax year. Tax year for a CFC means the year required under Section 898. Under very old proposed regulations, this can be any year until the CFC generates a subpart F inclusion. Thereafter, it must be the majority U.S. shareholders year. Looking again at the Berg's chart, Berg's Limited has a majority shareholder, but Berg's GmbH does not. See those proposed regulations for what to do here. Only the last day of the CFC's year counts. Whoever owns the shares of that CFC on that day has the inclusion. So be cautious when buying CFC shares. You may get stuck with subpart F and 951 cap A inclusions, even if the seller was foreign. Or, if worthwhile, make a 338 election for the day before the acquisition. That can have its own advantages and drawbacks. As I said before, everything has to be converted to U.S. dollars before it goes on a U.S. tax return. This includes the 951 cap A amounts. The amounts are all first computed in the CFC's functional currency, then translated to dollars at the average rate for the year. Changes to the exchange rate can result in changes from year to year in the shareholder's 10% of assets amount. Here's an example. CFC has a building for which it paid 10,000 Ubuntus when the Ubuntu was worth a dollar. Basis and depreciation are tracked in Ubuntus, not dollars. So the net basis changes not only by the depreciation, but also by the impact of exchange rate differences on cost and accumulated depreciation. Translation effects have the potential to be huge. We tax people often ignore them in our thinking. The IRS and Federal Reserve both publish average rates for a lot of currencies for the calendar year. If the CFC has a fiscal year, the Fed also provides daily rates for certain major currencies and you can calculate the average. Otherwise, you're on your own. How you go about translating, including source of your exchange rate, is a method of accounting and changing it requires IRS permission. A U.S. shareholder that is a domestic corporation, meaning incorporated in a U.S. state or in D.C., gets a deduction of 50% for its overall Section 951 Cap A inclusion. This is really as straightforward and simple as it sounds. See the International Tax Channel video on this and other aspects of the deduction under Section 250. Individuals don't get this deduction. CFCs generating losses in a tax year have two effects. First, the shareholder's share of loss offsets his share of 951 cap A inclusion from other CFCs for the same year. If the aggregate is a loss, too bad, so sad. The loss doesn't carry over. Second, the proposed regulations exclude the loss CFC's 10% amounts in computing aggregate return on assets. This may be contrary to the statute, but that's not clear. I discussed this earlier. There's also an allocation rule to take into account the impact of losses. Under this rule, the net 951 cap A inclusion is effectively allocated among the positive 951 cap A amounts proportionately, allocating zero to loss CFCs. Section 951 cap A inclusions are not subpart F inclusions. They don't have the same limitations and are in addition to subpart F inclusions. However, for some purposes, they are treated like subpart F income. These purposes include computing amounts considered previously taxed and thus excluded under Section 959 for the 962 election 
and for estimated tax payments. There are a few other items. The law and proposed regulations have a list of the very few code sections affected. In The Martian, one of my favorite movies, when a top official complains about the proposed solution, they say, we haven't even gotten to the bad stuff yet. Well, now we'll get to the bad stuff. If you've watched this far, I assume you know your way around taxes. These are reminders for you, since you may need them. First and foremost, make sure you're competent to do the work. If you're not an international tax specialist, and the potential inclusions are even close to material, get help from someone who knows how to do it. Someone like me. That someone's fees won't be cheap. The data requirements may exceed what you've asked for before. Make sure the client knows what's expected of them and when. Set and enforce deadlines for getting information from the client or you're toast. Make sure they know you're going to charge extra for this and then charge extra. One of your biggest battles will be depreciable asset basis. You must recompute it under U.S. tax principles. That means using straight line and class life, which is actually good news. You may be tempted to use a depreciation system to try to do this. That will likely create far more review work than a simple yearly Excel spreadsheet with vintage accounts. Don't just barge in with preconceived notions of what's easier. Think before you act. The next big hurdle is the modified version of 861 allocation and apportionment. The subpart F version of the rules apply, not the regular version of Section 861. If you're using something like Corp International, it is likely doing it already. Otherwise, expect massive work. Yet another problem is cross-chain interest and royalties to which special rules apply. There are tracing rules and you may need to resolve circularities. Finally, pro rata ain't necessarily pro rata, as I discussed before. You must understand much more about the client's affairs than in the past. Hopefully this series of videos has been helpful without being overly confusing. While 951 Cap A is only two pages, it directly invokes several hundred pages of regulations on related topics. 951 Cap A won't go away anytime soon. It's part of making the U.S. a tax haven for multinationals under the 2017 law. If you like these videos, please subscribe to the International Tax Channel. I wish you the best of luck for the 2018 tax year and beyond.